Forward Guidance is brought to you by VanEck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about VanEck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Claudia Som of Som Consulting. Uh, Som served as Section Chief of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, and I'm delighted to, to speak with her today. Uh, Claudia, I want to start out. Uh, over the past two years, a recession has been widely forecasted by many uh, in the economics community and, and in the finance, you know, on, on Wall Street. Has there ever been a period in history where for you know, two years in a row, a lot of people were forecasting a recession and then it didn't happen? Well, you, what do you make of that? It's highly unusual. I mean, frankly, we're not supposed to be able to forecast recessions and certainly in a consensus way. And and there were forecasts out there that were with very high certainty, right? It's coming. It's here right around the corner. And for two years, I mean, this was really the view. And there was a reason for the view. It was that inflation was very high. And in the past, particularly in the 1970s, to get inflation down, to break an inflation mentality, the Federal Reserve under Paul Volcker basically threw the U.S. economy into a recession. Right? Like it was... And that was their intention. Now, it had been years and years of high inflation, so even we can argue about whether that was the right thing to do. And so there was this view that the only way we can get inflation down that is this high is if we have a recession. And you had economists like Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, saying we need a recession. And, and frankly, he was putting some pretty big numbers out there. And it all went back to this logic that's often referred to as the Phillips curve. So it's this trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And that wasn't the case. I had argued from the very beginning that this was not the 1970s. The inflation was caused by COVID disruptions. Then Putin showed up and created more disruptions by invading Ukraine. And that these would work out. These were not primarily demand. This was not about the rescue plan. It was about COVID. It was going to take some time. And throughout all of this, we saw a very strong labor market. So the, and people had, you know, they'd paid down debt, they had savings, everything was there for us to avoid a recession. That's why I felt very strongly that we weren't in one, we weren't necessarily headed to one, and it, it certainly wasn't necessary. And what do you think now? Well, the last few years were kind of lonely. There were, you know, I was well outside of consensus, though not alone. There were other people pointing at this. Now consensus has shifted to, largely shifted to we we're going to avoid a recession, or there's a very high chance. In 2023, we saw massive disinflation. So inflation came down. And at the same time, unemployment stayed very low. Growth stayed very high. And so that trade-off, at least in 2023, it wasn't there. right? And we are within a percentage point of the Fed's target personal consumption expenditure index for inflation. So we're not there yet. We do not have the mythical soft landing, which I consider inflation back to target and unemployment still low. So we're not there yet, but it's like we can see the runway. We are getting close. And to say we need a recession for that last mile, that that really has fallen to the wayside. There's still a lot of discussion about how hard it's going to be that last mile. And that's a legitimate discussion to have, but it's being had in a, in a different space than we need a recession. And I will say one of the biggest risk I see to the soft landing is the Fed, right? If they push too hard, if they wait too long, they could accidentally cause a recession. So we're not out of the woods, but we've definitely switched from consensus of recession to consensus of no recession or at least much lower chances. But now it sounds like you think that your perception of recession might be elevated because of the Fed, that they keep interest rates too high for too long? It is my base case now that we avoid a recession. That has been my base case all the way through. I am watching the Federal Reserve very carefully. I believe in the Fed. They will eventually do the right thing. It just might be too late, right? So they are absolutely the biggest risk under the economy. And yet, I mean, they're coming at this with good judgment, right? But it is the Fed. They tend to drag their feet. There are still what the Fed and some of the critics see as parallels to the 1970s, which would also tell the Fed to be very cautious in raising rates 
what they think is maybe too soon, right? So, so the Fed, the longer they wait, for me, the higher the risk rises that we end up in a recession. But these are still relatively low risks, and they are certainly not my base case. What do you think is something about the Federal Reserve, the, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, that you learned and you you know from from working there that people mo- most people would be surprised to learn? It's important to look at the world the way the Fed looks at it, which isn't necessarily intuitive to people outside of the Fed. I have gained a lot of insight, of course, from being in the building and understanding, in particular, how the Fed reads data. Right? We look at the details. We go under the hood. One, the, an experience last week where it was so clear, the kind of jarring difference between how the world, even really smart people in markets look at data and how the Fed does. Consumer price index, the CPI came out on Monday. It wasn't good. Right, It was definitely disappointing. Then retail sales came out on Thursday and it wasn't good. It was disappointing too. And then Friday to round it all off, we had the producer price index, which also was not good, right? In different directions, inflation high is bad and retail sales low is bad. Okay. So we saw every day, particularly in the bond markets where they're trying to price in the probabilities of the first cut or the 10-year treasuries, they were getting whipsawed around every day. Now I saw Mary Daly speak on that Friday after the PPI had come out at the National Association of Business Economics, their policy conference. And she was asked, what do you make of this week with the data? And she's like, eh, you know, my, my views on the economy, my views on inflation, they're not changed. Because if you looked under the hood of any of these data sets, there were some things that were, look kind of anomalous. You know, January effects and weather effects. Now, no one should go at that and say it explains away all of it. Like it was still going to be not as good releases as we've seen in some recent months there were some strange factors that are likely maybe not in february but you know going forward to unwind though they might not i mean it's definitely more you know what are we looking at but we'd also had six months of really good data one month does not override it yet if you watch markets they get like a data point and they just go nuts now i blame the fed to some extent because they tell markets we're data driven we're data driven to like an extreme and Markets don't know how, I mean, there's some former Fed people out in markets, but in general, the Fed interprets data and dissects data in a way that a lot of investors don't have that ability. The other thing I'd say that really came in handy in the past few years is I read a lot of history about the Fed. I read, I mean, one of, I don't know if I call it my favorite book, one of the books I've gone back to again and again, Ben Bernanke has a recent you know, overview of kind of monetary policy. Alan Blinder has, you know, review. These are both people that had very high ranking positions at the Fed. And it's so like how the Fed sees itself and the history of the 1970s. And even if I disagree, like, I don't think the 1970s have a lot of parallels to now, but I know the Fed thinks it does. Right. So it's trying to like back up when you think about what's the Fed likely to do really think about the Fed and the context and try not to superimpose what you think they should do. And I have to be careful about that because there's a lot of daylight between what I think they should do and what I think is likely. And yet, you know, both things are useful to think about, but you really got to think about the Fed the way it thinks itself. And it is a strange beast, right? So you got you to put some time into it to really figure out how it ticks. That's such a good point that, you know, people can debate, oh, I, I think the Fed is making a mistake. Interest rates should be higher or lower. But really what they think and what anyone who doesn't work at the Fed thinks is kind of irrelevant. It's about what the Fed, Federal Reserve thinks. Yeah. I mean, they're watching, right? Like the Fed is, I, I would tease when I was there, it's like the Hoover vacuum of data and information, right? They bring everything in. They look at the opinion pieces. They look at, you know, and some people's opinions, maybe particularly former Fed or of great interest, right? So they're try- they're, they are trying as best they can to challenge their own beliefs, bring in more data, bring in perspectives. I mean, it's hard. Like the Fed is, like they have to really work hard not to end up being a closed system, right? Because it is, again, it's a very unusual place, but they do look, and it is important for people to talk about what they think is likely or, or talk about what they think the Fed should do. Because sometimes the Fed... You know, if reality moves in that direction, the Fed will move. 
like they really are data driven. It's just they often they can be slow to move off their story. And honestly, that's not a bad attribute for the Fed. We do not need a Fed that is all over the map. Like they cannot do what markets did last week, you know, every other day kind of, oh, no, I cut May, June, <laughs> you know, so um, we want them to be steady as she goes. And yet we want them to go. but They do eventually have to move. Right. Earlier, you said the Fed you know, might be making a mistake by telling the market that we are data driven, data driven. Tell us more about what you meant by that. The Fed has gone into a somewhat extreme position in data driven. And and this comes from guidance that Fed Chair Jay Powell has been making recently. So when he was on 60 Minutes, he said, you know, recognize we've had several months of good data. I mean, there's like six months of really moving down PCE core inflation. Okay, so we've had several months of good data, but the Fed tells us that's not enough. We want more to be confident. And he said, so it's clear, like they want more data right in hand data are inherently backward looking and they are your data right and the fed look monetary policy regardless of whether you think it's short or long it works with lags right because it'll first have an effect in an interest rate sensitive sector like housing and then the next rounds that get into consumer spending where it's like a realtor is laid off. The realtor goes out to lunch less. So then some of the people at the restaurant get laid off and on and on it goes. It takes time for it to get into consumer spending. And if you don't get into consumer spending, you're not slowing it down, right? Like that's such a big piece of the, the overall economy. So it takes time. So you can see why it is problematic if you look backwards because your policy works forward. So there's that piece. The other part... This, I think it's going to be tricky for the Fed. I don't know that this is so much I worry about markets with this. The labor market, when it starts to deteriorate, it goes slowly at first. So the recession indicator that I have, the so-called SOM rule, the we are we have been historically in a recession when there is a very small increase in the unemployment rate. A half a percentage point up from its prior low is not much. Considering that it ends up about two, three percentage points, four above where it started. If once you start to see even a modest amount of weakening in the labor market, it's probably too late, right? Because it gets a dynamic going. Now, it doesn't always have to be the case. And some rule is not, did not come down from God, right? Like it could break this time. Other things have broken in this cycle, other relationships. And yet, again, if you're looking backwards, you may miss what's right in front of your face in terms of the policy and the Fed works forward. So in the past, I think the Fed has done a better job of, yes, we're data driven, but didn't come out and say, we are looking at this one data series and it has to improve. And we don't know exactly how many months, they don't have to be better, they have to be at least as good. It makes it so focused on those data as opposed to Here's how we're forecasting. Here's how we're, and they are doing that. And yet their communication is so, and I think their thinking legitimately is so tied into backwards. And then they look at the strong labor market. They look at the strong growth. As Fed officials have said this point blank in public, because of that strength, we have the luxury of time to get confident. And again, it's like, what is that? Right. Like that's that's not how we're supposed to forecast. We're going like, you know, we can really push on the American worker. So we have like a security blanket that we have enough months to start cutting. So the Fed is doing some things that are unusual for it. And yet these have been very unusual times. It's a risk. And frankly, I worry with my risk scenario for the Fed is that they break something in financial markets. First, I'm less worried about the labor market, though, as it goes on, I, you know, it's not a, a non-trivial risk, but markets do not appreciate uncertainty. And we have had, it has been a really rough ride for four years. And so to keep pushing on it, to me, is like they're, they're rolling the dice here that markets, particularly interest rate sensitive parts of it, can just, you know, push through this year. And baseline, I think we will. It's just, it's, it's risky.
what you said you're less worried about the labor market and you're more worried that the Fed might break something in financial markets. What might that be? So we've we've talked a lot about commercial real estate as a as a pressure point. That's one where my understanding is it's more likely to be a slow burn. Right, these contracts tend to be spread out in terms of when they reset. Now, the ones that are resetting this year, or have, I mean, this is not good, right? Interest rates are well above whatever they had negotiated before. Financial market breaking, you know, there are less transparent corners of markets, so like um, private credit. And I'm not saying any of these are where things are going to break, but you talk about recessions being hard to forecast. Financial crises are not easy to forecast. I mean, there usually are some people that have, you know, think something's up, but in general, that's not a known. The closest I was last year to taking off the no recession call was when Silicon Valley Bank went under and it started to spread. Now, the Fed and regulators got it under control. So we moved past that. And if something broke in financial markets this year and they got it under control, it'd be okay. Like we'd probably move past it. What we've seen, because the Fed moved rates up so much, so fast, and so unexpectedly in 2022, it created a lot of pressure on, again, parts of the market, banks, insurance companies that really like weren't able to hedge that risk as quickly because it just moves so fast. And, you know, they can be holding out for lower rates and not get them now. Uh, and that interest rate risk, what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, is it pub- the rate risk punished stupid, right? Silicon Valley Bank was making incredibly bad management decisions, and yet, like, they'd been making them for a while, right? It took the environment that the Fed had created and some other special factors to blow the roof up on, off on that one. It's not, I don't know what it would be, but we still have that environment of rates are higher than people expected even a few years ago. And again, I worry as I watch markets kind of grapple with when is the first cut, how much, like it's just people are on pins and needles. And again, that is never a good setup, right? Because things can happen. Why do you think it is that some crises or blow up such as Silicon Valley Bank, the Federal Reserve can, you know, ring fence and get under control quite quickly. And, you know, there are other issues such as the, the great financial crisis where the Federal Reserve is using all of its tools and it's rolling out you know, new programs. And it seems like the, the crisis just get, gets on being worse. And I guess, is there sort of a spectrum of financial instruments over which the Federal Reserve has a lot of control, such as interest rates and, you know, h- uh, how collateral can be valued versus other things? And, and you know, might commercial real estate be on you know, commercial real estate and private credit, where are they on that sort of spectrum over how much the Federal Reserve uh, has influence? Right. So Silicon Valley Bank, that fell right in the bread and butter of the Fed. And the reason we have the Federal Reserve is to be the lender of last resort, to you know make sure banks don't fail, safety and soundness where they oversee banks to make sure that they're in good shape. I mean, the safety and soundness really fell on its face with Silicon Valley Bank. And yet, containing banking crises, like the Fed knows how to do that, right? That is that is a type of institution the Fed has oversight and they can step in. With the financial crisis, one of the problems were some of the, actually many of the entities that were falling apart, they were not banks, right? And so, and in particular, you really got way outside of even what you'd think of as the typical financial institutions, like not the Laymans, the Bear Stearns, when you got to AIG, Right. That was really not an entity that the Fed would normally have had to deal with. And, and then there were changes after with Dodd-Frank to pay more attention to these systemically risky institutions. Right. So the Fed broadened out its remit. The Fed has struggled for some time with the entire non-bank system, right? Because they don't have oversight of them. So there are players in the financial system that the Fed has more or less oversight over. And yet we saw with and this definitely happened with the Silicon Valley Bank, but also during 2020, if the Fed sees a need for liquidity, I mean they just opened it up, right? Like they were having facilities for municipal bonds, for treasuries, for corporate. I mean, like there was a lot. So the Fed has gotten more and more comfortable with if there's a crisis, we're gonna get you money. Like and as long as there's liquidity, everything will pull through. And the Fed knows how to create liquidity. <laughs> 
so it depends a little bit on exactly what the crisis is. So that's why, again, it's not what I see as a big risk, but it's important for us to think about tail risk. Like, what are the things that could happen? And we should think about what would it look like if they started to happen so we can move to it. But that doesn't, it doesn't mean that like, oh, this is going to happen. Again, this is not base case. This is not anywhere clear, close to a base case. It's just something I'm keeping an eye on because as the old adage goes, the Fed will go until it breaks something. Like this has happened before. So we just want to make sure that we're watching and when it gets close to breaking something, they can pull it back. They know this stuff too. Like there's, there's a lot of, there's absolute vigilance in terms of what they're doing at the Fed. But, you know, we all make mistakes. So let's return to the labor market and the SOM rule. So I think it's the three month average uh, having a 50 basis point change from peak to trough over, over the past year. Correct me if I misstated that. So uh, I'm not looking at the average, but the, the lowest rate was 3.4 and then we went to 3.8 and now we're at 3.7. Again, you've got to look at the averages, but where are we on the uh, some rule is it safe to say it hasn't been triggered yet, but is it close to being triggered? Right. So it's important. You take the three month average all the way back. So it's the entire series. So the low over the last 12 months, so that's the look back as past 12 months is 3.5%. Right. So that 3.4, that was like the mm-hmm. lowest month. So you average it out 3.5%. You get to uh, through January, those last three months, it was at 3.7%. So the SOMO right now is at two tenths percentage point. The trigger is five tenths. So we're not, we're not really close. I mean, it's not zero during, you know, several years in the recovery, it was basically zero as we had very low. I mean, we hung around at three and a half percent for quite a while. So now last fall, it did start to move up in a way that looked, it looked, disconcerting right and then there were revisions to last year and things moved back down with the unemployment rate so it got back into i think what's a more comfortable uh place but again the som rule is a recession indicator when it triggers when we get to that half a percentage point in the past and it's perfect since the 1970s only triggers in recessions never outside of recessions but when it triggers we're already a couple months into a recession this is not a forecast. This is, I mean, it was developed as a, let's start the fiscal, right? Get the checks out, right? So it was, it was always intended to be an indicator, but, you know, increases in the unemployment rate to get to five tenths percentage point, you got to have two tenths, three tenths, four, tenths, you know, so there is an aspect of as the unemployment rate rises, it's not a good sign. And yet anything below five tenths percentage point, we will see it and not always have a recession. Do you think that, that it will be triggered this year? My base case is no recession. So I think it is unlikely for it to be triggered. There is a scenario of it triggering. So the unemployment rate drifts up. It'd have to get up to about 4% and hang around there or some combination of being above and, you know, three month average. But the three month average has got to be 4% for it to trigger. As I said before, a lot of relationships have broken down in COVID. So we had two quarters of a decline in GDP in 2022 that were not a recession. Labor market looked great. Consumers were spending. You have to go back to 1947 to find two quarters of GDP declines outside of a recession. Real GDP, right? Real GDP, yes. Inflation adjusted. So now post-war era may be a good uh, parallel to what we're living in terms of COVID because of all the supply disruptions. Uh, so GDP as a was often referred to as a technical recession, totally failed in the United States. So the SOM rule could, quote unquote, break in that unemployment, as we readjust the economy and get the labor markets going you know, in, in a place of balance, the unemployment could drift up to 4%, maybe go a little bit above it. But if it doesn't keep rising, if it doesn't, you know, two percentage points up above the low, was our, our mildest recession in many decades. So it was in 2001. Obviously, we've seen some really bad recessions in the last couple of rounds, but you know, three, three, four percentage points might be a kind of a typical um, recession. So if the SOM roll goes up and you hit five tenths, and then maybe it hit six, ten, 
and then it just kind of levels off or goes back down. That is not a recession. So if it triggers and there is no recession, that is the song we're breaking. If it were ever going to break, it would be this time, right? Because just everything has been messed up. And yet, if it does break, I'm going to be very concerned because we should go with the base case that once the labor market starts deteriorating, it keeps going. Like that is a very strong cycle that gets, um, you know, it can get this real downward spiral. I don't expect it to trigger this year. I don't expect a recession. And yet there are real risks out there that we could, even if unintentionally, like the Fed is not trying to push us into a recession. They have been very clear that they are now in a place where they see both sides of the mandate, you know, low inflation and low unemployment, as being much more balanced, right? Because inflation is really close to target. So they are more aware of, I think they'll still be really slow, but they are more aware of risks that could be in the labor market because they understand and they do have a dual mandate. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you could lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. How would you characterize the health of the labor market? It was described as, as being very strong. What do you think are the most important indicators? You know, there's non-farm payrolls, the unemployment rate, uh, job openings, jolts. What do you think are the most important, the most salient? And what do you think the Fed thinks is the most salient? There's two pieces of this. One is how to describe the labor market in general. And then the second is what are we looking for in terms of it might be weakening? Okay, so in terms of the labor market in general, we've had really solid payroll gains. Again, anomaly, or like we got a really big number for January. That's probably really big for some reasons that aren't like the real world. But it was so big, it's still good, right? Like you can't take, you know, plus 300,000 and be like, oh, you know, wash it all away. Just like I can't take that CPI and wash it all away with technical factors. Like there, there is something there. So you look at the payroll gains, Look at the unemployment rate. One piece that has been extremely important for the rebalancing is the labor force. An important part of turning the corner in 2023 was addressing the labor shortages. And we had had millions of people walk away from work, not get fired, just walk away from work early in the pandemic. Some came back. It was very slow getting them back. It took a while to get schools reopened. It took a while to get the vaccine out. But we still had a real gap between where we started in the labor force and now, and we had an economy that was really cranking. So it's not surprising, businesses were having trouble finding workers, had to really push up wages in a way that was like more than they could handle without passing it on to customers. Okay, so we got to last year and we made some real gains in the labor force. An important piece was the administration was finally able to process many of the backlogged work visas for immigrants. These are people who had jobs set up in the United States they came in, that was a big increase in the labor force that took a lot of pressure off of the labor shortages. We also saw women's employment, prime age women hit an all time high. We had a lot of marginalized groups, whether it's disabled workers or black men hit also all time highs in terms of their participation. I mean, a, a, full, a full employment economy can really bring people in. So that was really important to take some pressure off of wages. And frankly, we haven't seen that work itself all the way through into consumer service prices, right? Because it, it takes time. CPI is the last place it shows up. Right? You got all of these kinds of inputs. And so that was, that was a big deal. So watching labor force and making sure those gains are maintained and we continue to some extent, that would be a, a huge help now. And all that looks good right now. Now, in terms of things to watch where, because again, the unemployment rate's not a great one because it moves so slowly, right? We want to get ahead of this. Why does the unemployment rate move so slowly as opposed to other labor market data? It just does. 
It is an interesting question. It does move really slow, and it it almost it almost always peaks after the recession has ended, even right. It's it's those feedback loops that have to get going, but it's nothing about the measurement. It's just about the dynamics and the workforce. Uh, so one place, the job openings and labor turnover survey. I think the job openings number, while there are certain Fed officials like Chris Waller, governor, who just talk about it all the time. I think for a lot of reasons, that's a pretty problematic series to interpret. And yet some really good information, the jolts are looking at the the quits rate, the firing rate, the hiring rate. Because these tell us something I think more about the dynamics, the openings are a little hard uh, to interpret. And what we've seen is the hiring rate, which have been very high as the labor shortages were so intense, has trended down. And in fact, it is below where it was before the pandemic. That's a, that's a cautionary sign. The quiz rate has come down, but it had been very high. I mean, because that's a sign of you have all these different options. So that wasn't as surprising. But the hiring rate notably has come down and kept like, falling further it really hasn't leveled out yet so of course you want to see that but the firing rate has stayed very low and it has so it's a little bit of it looks a little bit like this labor hoarding story like employers found it so hard to rehire workers so they're just like hanging on and frankly the economy's been good so they may continue so that's one piece that one wants to look at there's also been some attention to the hours worked in the economy is basically anything that you can get at, which have been declining, but also that could be rebalancing. You know, it, it's not necessarily a bad sign. And yet anything you can look for that says, hey, the labor market is weakening. You want to pay attention to that. On the other side, you always have to balance the risk. One thing that the Fed has been paying a lot of attention to are what, what do the wage dynamics look like? Because again, that's often something that businesses either have to or choose to pass on to customers. And we're trying to get this inflation down. And wages, there's all kinds of different measures. They're not always consistent. The um, employment cost index, which is kind of the, the gold standard one, has decelerated the wage growth. Um, but not all this series. And they're still all elevated from before. And so that could be a, a cost pressure that pushes the Fed to delay longer. It could potentially. But so far, I mean... Again, so far, these are like risks out there. Not The base case looks pretty good, and it's improved, especially as the wages, there's less pressure. And we, we're getting out of these labor shortages, largely are out of them. And that, that was causing a lot of disruptions. And we're getting workers back, which is what we needed. Getting workers back, and that's what we need, uh, increasing the labor force participation rate. And I'm saying this for the audience, that when more people are in the labor force, that's the denominator for the unemployment rates. So that un unemployment rate could go up. So two potential signs of weakness. You, uh, one, you mentioned average weekly hours of all employees, which you know I'm on Fred.com. It, it peaked about 35, and now it's at 34.1. That doesn't seem, you know, that's uh, 50 minutes or something, something like that. And then there's full-time employment versus part-time employment. Folks point out that a lot of the jo job gains have been to part-time employment. Do either of those indicators give you uh, any worry at all? What I'd say on the full-time versus part-time is we saw as the recovery got going this time, full-time employment really shot up. I mean, this is good. I mean, full-time jobs tend to be better jobs, right? As we, as we left the Great Recession, it was part-time jobs that jumped and full-time really lagged behind. So we had the part-time jobs lagging behind in this recovery. And it is true, particularly last year, many of the gains, particularly towards the end of the year, we had big gains in the part-time work. But this is usually as a fraction of the workforce, they tend to move together in quote-unquote normal time. So some of this was catching up or right? getting back on track. There's nothing inherently bad about a part-time job. It depends why you have one. If you look, and the um, participants in the survey, they're asked, why are you part-time? The percent of people who are working part-time and then tell us they're working part-time for economic reasons, which basically is they can't find a full-time job or the conditions in the labor are bad. That fraction of part-time workers 
is so low, like re like very close to all time lows. So it's like looking at part time jobs increasing. It's important to look at, well, are this part time for economic reasons? That's a bad sign. Like if you have that fraction really moving up and we see it in recessions around recessions, but part time work can be a real flexibility. Like if you have caregivers who need to be at home for many hours, but also want a part time job and in a good labor market, what's interesting that's often, I think, a misconception is part-time jobs tend to increase in good times because, like, the jobs have to be out there, right? And so, like, yes, yeah, sometimes it is. it can be a hardship that you have to take a second job to make ends meet, and that was true before COVID, and it can be true now, but, like, that second job needs to be out there for you to take. Like it's a bigger problem if you only have one part-time job or, or just a full-time job and you need something else. A very small fraction of the people who are working part-time are doing it because they cannot find a full-time job. So part-time for economic reasons as a fraction of the, the part-time is very low, like close to all-time lows. Claudia, one huge uh, strength of U.S. economy has been consumer spending. And you know, I'm just reading that you, uh, you, you did a lot of work on consumer spending. When you joined uh, the the Federal Reserve uh, in two thousand seven, why do you think U.S. consumer spending has been so high? Well, in general, never bet against the American consumer, right? Yeah. Like they will spend. Sometimes they spend because they have to spend. Right? There's a lot of people paycheck to paycheck that it's not really a choice, and then we just like to spend, right? Like that's just part of the U.S. culture. Now you have to have money to spend. Right. And the most important determinant of spending is income. And for most Americans, the most important determinant of income is their paycheck. So the you get a very virtuous, and we see this now, a very virtuous cycle between the labor market and the consumer. And as long as those two keep that dance going, the U.S. economy keeps going. Right. And so this the labor market is at the foundation of the strong recovery in the United States, a recovery that our peer countries are not experiencing. Like the U.S. is really cranking. So how did we get this strong labor market? The relief that went out during the pandemic, everything from the CARES Act up through the rescue plan in the first year of covid made a massive difference in getting this recovery going. It got, it, I mean, it put a lot of money in people's pockets, and, and in many cases, more than they had maybe even lost. Right? Those stimulus checks, which I was a big proponent of, they went out broadly, and we needed broad spending. I mean, some people needed it to, to um, deal with hardship, but some people, we just needed them to get out and spend. And when customers come back, businesses need workers. Now, there was kind of a scramble because... The U.S. consumer came back faster than the U.S. worker in, in many cases. So there was a, a tough transition period. So there's a spending piece to help the labor market. The other thing that's helped spending keep going, in addition to the paychecks, is when that stimulus went out, whether it was the stimulus checks, the extra unemployment benefits, there were various kinds of relief that went to families. Many families took it and paid down debt. They saved it. There are the from 2019 to 2022 was the largest increase in household wealth since the surveys began in the late uh, 1980s. And, and it was across the board, every demographic group, every income group. You looked at the typical person in any group, their wealth was up record levels. I mean, we're talking like 30 percent. I mean, like, it's just really good. So we are in a moment where many Americans who have never had a financial buffer are in a better place. Now, obviously, after two years of high inflation, like not, these buffers don't last forever, but this gave us enough space to, again, get the consumers there, get the labor market going. And once you've got that going, it's really got legs. Unless something comes in and leans too hard on it, like the Federal Reserve could. Uh, but that's that's a big piece. Like you got to have the money to spend Really, anything else, wealth effects tend to be pretty small. So the stock market moves around, but how much that affects consumer spending is relatively marginal. And uh, interest rates would, I mean, there's something that's important. You know, you make a big purchase, you have to have to put it on credit or 
different things like that. And yet, because Americans pay down so much debt, they're much and have some money in the bank, they're less interest rate sensitive, or at least have been less interest rate sensitive than in a typical um, Fed tightening cycle. So, yeah, labor market is really important. And, and how do you explain the strength, the resilience, I should say, of the US housing market, which when interest rates collapsed in 2020, we had a huge boom. You know, that uh, coincides with orthodox thinking of you know, low interest rates to stimulate housing. But as interest rates surged, uh, mortgage rates surged, many, to be honest, including myself, thought that would significantly slow the housing market. And it did in terms of like refinances and stuff like that. But in terms of the fundamental bid and demand for new housing, it's really been proven to be quite strong. How do you explain that? The housing market has been a bit of a mess. I, mean, I I talked before about one of the ways the Fed was disruptive is they went so big, so fast, and so unexpectedly, right? So one one disturbance that we've seen in the housing market that we haven't seen in the past is we went from basically very low mortgage rates, where you had a very large number of homeowners with mortgages refinance, where that was when people were buying. So you have a lot of mortgages out there that have very low rates behind them, and the U.S. does primarily 30-year fixed, right? So they they are baked in there. Then you have a year, 2022, where everything just changes really fast. It disrupted, in addition to it became more expensive to get a mortgage and you know there was still a lot of demand, but the costs were higher. You had an absolute lack of inventory because people did not want to get out of these very low mortgages into higher ones. So this is where going fast in one year it caused this real like kind of whiplash. And as soon as you had low inventories, yeah, you might have discouraged some demand, but you hadn't discouraged enough demand given the low inventories, you had housing prices go up. I mean, I think in the residential investment, we absolutely saw some pullback, you know, with the interest rates. But yeah, the the housing market has just been really kind of a mess. And the Fed had been in the business of buying these mortgage-backed securities. I mean, just on all levels, like there were things going on where... The Fed has a lot to learn from what happened in the housing market. Above all else, they should never be buying mortgage-backed securities again. Uh, but it was it was more than that. I think broadly, the housing market could be a good place for us to, for the Fed to reflect on what does that delta do? Like it's not just how high the rates are, but how fast you get there. And the housing market is a, is an example, and maybe it was special features. But I think some of the other, like the Silicon Valley Bank, the Gil, like there are other places where you can see markets got hit or segments of the market got hit by the fact that they went so fast and really unexpectedly. So, but yeah, housing, housing is a total mess. Um, but the one thing I'll say about this, because it does come up in more broader conversations, oh, housing affordability is at its worst, which is true, right? I mean, to buy a home is really tough. And then you ask yourself, is the Fed raising interest rates really going to help shelter costs? No, because it's not encouraging supply. But but that's like a thing where policymakers need to understand that the Fed, when there's high inflation, you cannot look at the Fed and be like, they got this. Right? I mean, they can destroy enough demand to get all kinds of inflation down, even if it's supply driven. And yet it's a good opportunity for other policymakers like Congress to step in or state and local governments and be like, oh, we have some levers to pull on supply. I mean, in this case, it wasn't like kicking people out of their homes with low rates. I mean, it was more on the the building side, but asking the Fed to do it, they'll get it done. They will get inflation back down to 2%, but they could cause a lot of harm. And frankly, like we need that building like over many years to come not just about the inflation right now. You said the Federal Reserve has a lot to learn and the Federal Reserve should not be buying mortgage-backed securities. Uh, tell us more about that. And also, have you been an opponent of the Fed's purchase of agency mortgage-backed securities as part of quantitative easing for, for a long time? Or or did you know, has your view changed? This is a view that evolved during this crisis. I've always been, you know, unconventional monetary policy, the the asset-backed purchases, quantitative easing, quantitative tightening, these, you know, came out of, and they came out of the Great Recession and the recovery. And if you look at them, and they went back in the framework review that finished in 2020 and looked again at them, you know, to kind of, and I see things like 
QE and QT as the least bad of all bad options, right? Like I don't, the yield curve control, the raising the interest rate target, which they will never do. Uh, like these are, these weren't like palatable options and you got to do something. The, the, the 2% inflation target. Yeah. They are never moving that. That's like 2%. <laughs> I don't, unless there's some major sea change in who's at the fed for many, many reasons that it's just not moving up. But the problem was you're at the zero lower bound. They had to do something right. One of the great gifts of this cycle, if we get to the other side and we are sufficiently away from the zero lower bound, that would be awesome. It would be awesome if they never had used any of the unconventional monetary policy tools again, right? Like that was just including communication policy, <laughs> which has been like kind of its own problem. Uh, no, but what happened there's with quantitative easing, quantitative tightening, first, there's some tension between the Fed and financial markets as exactly how these work. I mean, Ben Bernanke famously said it works, but we don't know why or how. You know, and this is not a good tool to have. About QE? About QE. Yeah, he's being a little flip. But I mean, you know, I mean, this is this was a tool they just pulled off the shelf in a fire and hadn't used it. And it seemed to do some good. But anyway, so when we got into this recovery, particularly, I think, as we were starting to see the rate increases and they had to, you know, move from QE to QT and the rates are going up. You look back and it's like in 2020, the Fed absolutely as lender of last resort, getting liquidity out in the market, they needed to be buying. But they didn't really call that QE, and they shouldn't. Like those lending, the emergency lending facilities were fundamentally something different. Getting money out, stabilizing the market, it wasn't about raising or lowering interest rates, it was stabilizing the market. And by 20, the end of 2020, it was clear, mission accomplished, right? So those lending facilities should have been closed down I mean, they were, right, it, you know, varying timelines, closed down, and that should have been it. And in part because fiscal went big this time, right? So monetary policy on the QE side could have stepped away. And as we watch things go on, particularly as we got into the mortgage, what we saw was happening in housing markets, it's really hard to look at this and say this was more good than bad. Right? Like it was disruptive, and frankly, it wasn't necessary. So I could see them stepping away from the mortgage-backed securities. I think there's a pretty high chance they get out of that business. Whether they walk away from buying the treasuries, that would be a different case. I think it'll stay in the toolbox, right? Like they got to have something in the toolbox. And yet the chances that they don't have to use that tool or even go into that toolbox next time is uh that chance is rising and not just because they're waiting to cut and all this stuff but if the trends like the productivity growth we've seen pick up if the you know the labor market keeps firing on all cylinders that's an economy that can support and has a higher interest rate attached to it like we weren't just close to the zero lower bound because we kept you know getting hit and couldn't raise it was also the economy was really weak like that's where it wanted to settle. Or that's where it looked like it wanted to settle. So we can move out of this in a place where those unconventional tools aren't as necessary. And yet I would be surprised if the mortgage-backed security comes to the other side of this next framework review as with as positive a review as it went in, like it came out of the last review. Because I think it has caused more problems than necessary. Sorry to interrupt, just want to tell you about BlockWorks upcoming crypto symposium in London, the Digital Asset Summit, which is running from March 18th to March 20th. Everyone in crypto is going to be there, not just the experts and policymakers, but the real industry leaders writing the checks. Over $800 billion in assets is going to be represented. Anyone who's anyone in crypto is going to be there. So if you're into crypto and you haven't bought your ticket yet, the time is now to get your ticket. I would not wait any longer. We've got some exciting guests on the macro side too. Julian Brigden, Michael Howell, and yes, I can confirm at last the rumors are true. Joseph Wang, the Fed guy himself, is going to be there too. I'll be hosting a panel with these macro heavyweights that you don't want to miss. So be there or be square. Click the link in the description and use code FG10 to get 10% off. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Hmm. Do, do you think that R star a neutral policy rate uh, and or the right end of the dot plot, the longer run rate, uh, 
Do you think that is, you know, 2.5%? How do you think about a neutral rate, which, you know, for, for our audience is a rate that is neither stimulative nor restrictive? And how does the Fed think about it at, at this time? Yeah, the neutral rate of interest is a useful construct. Like to think about, just to have this idea of there, the Fed, when when we get the dual mandate, when we're at two percent inflation, when unemployment is low, we should be at a place with interest rates where the Fed is out of the game, right? Because the neutral rate, if you're above the neutral rate, you're pushing down on the economy. If you're below it, you're pushing up on it. Okay, so we we should have this sense of when things are in the right place, the Fed should be not affecting anything. And it's important to remember, like the Fed has no opinion, nor should it have an opinion on what's the right growth level. I come across people who say, well, growth is really high right now, so the Fed shouldn't cut. No, no, no. Like the Fed is using that as a um, safety blanket or security, like that it can say, oh, growth is high, so we don't have to move as fast. But they would never say growth is high, or they've moved away from anything that sounds like that. Growth, like high growth is bad. High inflation is bad. High growth is not bad. So that that concept of there is a place where the Fed just strives to not be relevant, right? So it's a good thing. Now, I'm definitely in Jay Powell's camp that, you know, these these stars, you know, there's R star, Y star, which is potential output. There's pi star, which is the inflation. I mean, there's little stars all over the place in macro. We cannot observe or measure any of these. And they're almost certainly, because our economy is very dynamic, they are almost certainly moving all over the place, right? So to get all like, oh, it's this number, it's that, like, you know, you're just, it's not we're making them up. These are informed uh, decisions, but it's also like, come on. Um so now I think there is a very good argument, as I said, with like the productivity growth, that whatever over the long run, over the, the many coming years, this neutral rate is, it's likely, we have to see the developments over the, you know, as we come out of this, but it's likely that that neutral rate is higher than before. So before it was two and a half. I mean, it's still what's in their forecast, right? Their uh -huh. median. Now, right now, the federal funds rate is at, five and a quarter. And I think everyone would agree, Jay Paul, they are in a restrictive territory. So, okay. So the neutral rate is somewhere between five and a quarter and two and a half. So to me, this is, and that's really all the specificity. And I went and kind of looked like, cause I find Fed officials giving numbers. No, it's, you know, they're all like, oh, it's above where it was before, but oh, we're in restrictive territory. That is way too wide of a gap for us to say this is useful, right? It mm -hmm. sounds good. It's not useful. So I, I mean, you know, spitballing like the rest of us. I mean, to me, it's probably like we're in some like three to three and a half. But honestly, until we see that productivity growth, whether it sticks, and if this full employment economy looks like it's bringing in more and more people, I don't know. And it's very refreshing to see Powell. And he did this even in speeches right when he came in, his first Jackson Hole, so well before COVID, was not poking fun, but the title of the speech was Navigating by the Stars. And uh -huh. he was very clear, like, <laughs> like, we don't know what these are, but conceptually, it's useful. He said more recently, like last year, we know the neutral rate by its works. So it's like, we see it in the economy, so we know. My problem with that, I mean, it's a great line. It also reinforces that he's not taking like little point estimates too seriously, which he should not. Um, the problem with that logic is the Fed is not the only game in town. When we have a $24 trillion plus economy, the Fed is in there. Its effects are seen most in interest rates, but it's the short term interest rates that it really has a hold on. Long term rates are what's most relevant for consumers and businesses. The Fed is absolutely in the, in the mix there. They're not the only thing. Right? They don't control those like the short term rates. And then once you get out into the wider economy, you've got fiscal, which absolutely one huge lesson of this is fiscal beats monetary every time. Right. Which means we need to work a lot more on fiscal to make it be as effective as possible. And so you can't just look at the U.S. economy and back out easily what the Fed is doing. 
you know, I, a lot of people are like, oh, the Fed is, you know, there's no transmission or it had really short lags. And so it's behind us. And I'm like, I'm not so sure about that. Like, it's clear when you look at interest rate sensitive sectors, the, like they've noticed the Fed, like it's having an effect. So just because it's transmission into, say, consumer spending hasn't bubbled to the top, it doesn't mean it isn't under there. Right. And the neutral rate, again, is like the Fed is no longer having an effect on the economy. The neutral rate is not the U.S. Treasuries are stable. It's like because other things can move them around. So it's it's really tricky to back out the neutral rate. Even if you're doing this, we know it by their works. Right. Because there's a lot of other things working right now and things working in ways that we haven't seen before. So, I mean, my heart goes out to the Fed as they try to figure this out. And, you know, I can talk about the neutral rate all day long. And it, it is conceptually interesting. The way we try and measure it is kind of interesting. And yet for policymakers trying to make a decision of do we cut 25 basis points at this meeting or that meeting? Do we do 75, 100? This is not particularly useful. Claudia, one thing I've observed about Powell, and I'm curious if you agree, is he likes to be very orderly with market expectations of interest rates. And that inclines me to have the following idea that like, if once the Federal Reserve starts cutting by 25 basis points increases, it will be meeting after meeting. And that's actually, you know, unlike I think Greenspan, he did a 50 and then a 25. Powell is you know, 25, 25, 25, stop, unless of course there's a crisis. Would you agree with that? Powell comes out of markets. Right. I, I said in a New York Times opinion piece very early on in the crisis that I the fact that Jay Powell is not a macroeconomist is such a blessing. Mm. I got a lot of flack from my <laughs> my friends over this. But if there was ever a moment to have someone who understood markets, understood how they think this was the moment. I mean, if you think of all that we have gone through in the last four years and markets have not just entirely crumbled, this is really impressive. I mean, and this this takes a chair who knows what they're doing. I mean, there are chairs, you don't have to go back that far, that said some stuff and markets like the taper tantrum was not, you know, Ben Bernanke's finest moment. Fine, he's not a, a markets person, right? Like I, he wasn't trying to upset things. Powell knows what he's saying. And he talks to markets and and I think he knows what they, not what they want to hear, but what they're able to absorb or kind of speak their language, um, which honestly is a little more like plain spoken people language, right? Like, <laughs> so, which I find so refreshing. So this idea of going gradually, which I think, you know, in the post, I mean, if you get out of like total um, panic moments where they're just dropping rates, you know, really aggressively, you really look from Bernanke on, they've been in this gradualist approach. I mean, Yellen was very much a Let's go very slow and that's all you know I mean this is also your personality very slowly um so I think that's where the thing that with Jay it's giving that real clear signal like trying to hold their hands and walk markets through it which has been a little tricky right like markets are really you know they've been kind of all over the place and they have a hard time reading the Fed even if Jay's being clear but they just come back and say it again Right. It, you know, Jay has been doing a lot of being out in public recently. He's the one to listen to. And if th by this point you haven't gotten the message, like you're not listening. Right. It's like totally willfully not listening. So that's good. I absolutely agree with your point. What their goal will be is to do in 25s. We are not going to see the 475s in a row. Like mm -hmm. unless something very bad is happening. And even then they wouldn't be in a row. It'd just be like all at once. So I think, you know, a cadence of they cut by 25 basis points. Maybe they wait and they skip a meeting, then they cut by 25 and they skip a meeting. Like I could see them really wanting to you know, dip their toe in the water, make sure inflation doesn't start to creep up or just stick. And then they'll go to another one. And I mean, this is why I get a little worried that they're going to wait too long because they're going to do it in such a slow way. It may be better to start a little sooner and do it in a slow way so you don't end up, you don't get forced into the, possibility of having to do it in a big way really fast but it is the fed this is very fed like so yeah i absolutely agree with you we're talking 25 basis points they're going to be well telegraphed one thing that the fed my impression of their communication this year it, it both ha it also has this like being conservative relative 
to the 1970s. Don't be Arthur Burns. You know, as soon as unemployment goes up, cut, and then inflation comes back more. Like, they don't want that. So that's their being really conservative. Arthur Burns also got very much in the re-election of Nixon. Right? He cut rates, and this was confirmed later on the Nixon tapes, he cut rates in order to help Nixon's re-election. And as soon as he got re-elected, they had to, I mean, inflation just came roaring back. So, like, nobody wants to be Arthur Burns, not on the mismanagement of monetary policy and absolutely not on the political coordination. So part of that, and, and it, this year, like, they're going to cut when they need to cut or not cut. Like, I think every single meeting is on the table. I don't care how close it is to the election. What they are going to want for, for both and all purposes, so maybe they even put Nixon aside, but even for the other Arthur Burns, they are going to want it to be so painfully clear in the data that no one can look at the data and be like, tis, tis, like, why are, why are you, you know, cutting Fed? And I mean, they're going to build a body of evidence that is so outrageously strong that again, could risk if they waited too long, but that's their protection is they can say, Hey, look at the data. Hey, look at the data to tell Democrats to get off our case right now. It's not there yet. We don't have the case. Or, hey, in September, October, look at the data. We need to cut. This isn't about Biden. It's, it's the data. So that's, I think the data are their crutch this year. And frankly, they're data driven. So it's not that far off them, but it's a little far. And they could use some more guidance from Powell, probably, on like just simmer down. Like he's kind of tried some. With the 60 minutes, like it doesn't, you know, like, oh. The market could use some guidance from Powell on saying relax. Yeah, just yeah. not every data point. You know, and Powell said it needs to be good, not better. It doesn't have to be as good. And he tried, right? But sometimes the Fed has to say things more than once, right? And, and we're going to have a read with the PC for January that's not going to be, frankly, it's going to barely pass as good, but, you know, it's definitely not going to be as good. By March, they're going to have the March meeting. They're going to have another read. It's another opportunity for him to be like, see, you know, balance this out. And in my opinion, it's putting stress on markets to have every single data release be this like market moving event, right? So like just get people to calm down a little bit. Yes, they're data driven, but they are not like every single data point is causing the Fed to move all over the place. If the Fed is not moving all over the place, markets do not need to be moving all over the place. Right. We need to get on the same page and steady as she goes. But I don't I don't judge on either side. Like this is tough. This is they do not have a roadmap for what they're trying to do. That's why I do coming back to your point. I think it's so important that Powell gets markets. Uh -huh. He may not get the academic macroeconomists and some of the talking heads. Those people are irrelevant. Right. Like they sound nice or grumpy, but it's like Powell's got, we got to get markets on board and through markets. It's like, and pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the real world with consumers and businesses and workers. Included in that, are, are you might be referring to when Powell gets markets that the, all the programs in March and April 2020, which the Federal Reserve rolled out, and a lot of them didn't need to be used because, like, if you carry a big stick, you don't have to swing it. Absolutely. And there was a play, even before Powell, that you could open up these facilities and it was just calming. What happened with the Powell Fed is they, I mean, they rolled out every facility under the sun. I mean, also into some asset classes like municipal bonds that people were a little like, why, why are we doing this? Right. And there were some medium sized business loans. I mean, they really went with, there was a breadth that was um, notable, but the world was on fire, right? Like no one was complaining about this. What a piece that was notable under, Powell, and because there are other regulators with Silicon Valley Bank, I can't say this was all the Fed, you know, they had the OCC and the FDIC, the aggressive measures that they took to stabilize financial market or the banking sector when Silicon Valley Bank failed and the few other banks around it. I mean, the, the terms were almost outrageous. Like they were, you know, people making good at par like there were there were no haircuts for the people who had money at Silicon Valley Bank that wasn't insured. They made them whole. Like that was an inc that was a very generous, very aggressive uh, stepping in, which, as you said, there are some parallels to 2020. It's like we're not wasting time. We're going all in here, and that was the same thing with Silicon Valley Bank. They just went all in. 
So there is this, if something were to break in markets that the Fed can go in and put the fire extinguisher on, I have a lot of faith they're going to do it. Like, they're not going to be this, oh, maybe we should let it go. Or, oh. <laughs> like, it was, I mean, they went all in on Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, that one, they didn't, they didn't have to, or, or it wasn't clear that they had to, but they felt they did. So that, that shows they take it very seriously. Well, Claudia, thank you so much for coming on, uh, um, sharing your insights. Can you just tell us uh, about SOM Consulting? What's the, the work you do and who are the kind of clients you work with? So at SOM Consulting, I do a custom research, so research nodes, macro topics. I also do talks and you know seminars, you know, put together macro economy outlook on the Fed. And and I do a lot of policy work and writing as well. So opinion writing. I have a website, Claudia Som, all one word, dot com. So that shows some examples of my work. That's the best place to go. There we go. Uh, thanks again and thanks everyone for watching. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. A reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at JackFarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.